Mr. Richard Smith. He's been in the solar industry for a good span of two decades. He's currently the president of Universal Solar. And he's also been in various, he's not only been familiar with the installation of solar, but also financing. So without further ado, we'll have uh, um, Richard Smith. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> Before I get started, is it possible to put Facebook on the sure, sure. I'm just use Facebook as my prop, show you some job photos right. as we talk about different projects. But I'll give you some background on me in the meantime. Mm -hmm. um, I am a solar energy contractor. <coughs> Anybody else here in the solar industry at all? You're in the solar industry? Kind of, sort of. Kind of, sort of. Kind of, sort of, Larry. Uh, I'll consider you solar for a long time. I don't want to do horticulture anymore. Okay, <laughs> all right. My son used to own a solar company. Solar company, okay. Chicago. Okay, great, okay. So I'm a Florida solar contractor, which in the grand scheme of solar, the solar world, um, we're not considered the most progressive state in the country when it comes to solar energy. Case in point, I just attended the Solar Power International show out in Las Vegas a couple of weeks ago, and that's you know sort of the biggest show that happens trade show-wise in the solar industry in the country. And uh, it's always funny to go around and talk to the different vendors, and they're very eager to talk to you, and they ask you, well, where are you out of? And they say, Florida, and their expression changes right away. They know, okay, this is probably not a high-volume guy at you know, Sun Edison or Solar City or one of these big, massive companies. Um, but they'll usually humor me, and, oh, it doesn't work. Uh, Wireless. Uh, here we are talking about technological innovation. Yeah. Um, so, <coughs> Solar, uh, Florida solar sort of lags behind when it comes to solar policy. I don't think that's any secret, especially in this crowd. Um, in fact, you've seen some pretty politically charged discussions going on this year uh, throughout this election cycle. You know, we have this vote no on one coming up in November where we have uh, a utility-backed solar initiative disguised as a grassroots effort. Now, these, are, these are my opinions. But the fact is that they, it's a utility-backed amendment uh, that they are proposing that would uh, prohibit the sale of solar electricity by third parties. For example, if this were a private business, uh, it would prohibit me from coming in as a solar company and saying, hey, Mr. Business Owner, allow me to install a big solar system on the top of this building, uh, and I'll sell you the energy that it produces at a reduced rate versus Duke Energy or OEC or whoever your utility provider is. This is pretty commonplace in most states in the union, with the exception of Florida and a handful of states like North Dakota, Wyoming, you know, places that don't really care about solar energy too much, don't have the option to care about solar energy. Uh, so they're trying to have that codified into the Constitution that, uh, that that sale of that electricity under that scheme would be prohibited in the state of Florida. And that is really, in my opinion, uh, what's driven the solar industry over the last five to ten years to the scale that it's achieved nationally and globally is the sale of third-party electricity or third-party sale of electricity. So we hope to defeat that in November. I did bring some flyers to pass out if anybody's not quite sure what, what this is all about. We did have a victory uh, in the primary with the, uh, with the uh, ballot initiative that was on there. Uh, we got a little win there thrown to us. Is it please work work? Yeah. No, I can sign in under mine, or you can sign in under yours. Your, we're just going to go to Universal Solar's Facebook page. <coughs> oh, I'm using hotspot. It should be server. All right, well, I'll just keep rolling. Well, oh, there's no service here. Yeah. Hey, this is an AT&T dead zone, apparently. Yeah. Oh okay. my goodness, you're kidding me. Do we have Wi-Fi here? Most of the library. Oh, well, maybe the library has Wi-Fi. Well, but... Oh. It's connected. I think the utilities it's are um, I'll give you oh, some... Yeah, uh, I'll give you some background on me in the meantime. I started in the solar industry in 19... Well, I say I started in the solar industry. I started dealing in solar products in 1996, and primarily solar pool heating panels, which was, was the solar industry in Florida up until about 10 years ago. Um, first came into contact with it there, I worked for a wholesale distributor called Hughes Supply, a pretty big distributor in Orlando, They're, they started in Orlando. Um, and, I, and it brought me into contact with these solar companies that I had never even considered before, these little solar companies all around the Central Florida area that are pooling in solar pool heating systems. 
Well, some of these companies were putting in solar water heating systems as well, which was pretty radical stuff to me at the time. Um, and that technology is fairly old. It's been out you know, for well, technically 1,000 or 2,000 years, I guess, if you really want to go back. But in its modern form, it's been out uh, for you know, around 50 years or so with copper and glass collectors and a tank and a, and a little pump. Solar electric systems, which are, you know, we say the sexiest solar systems, those are the ones that people get excited about, really didn't come into play in Florida in any, any recognizable scale until, I would say, about 10 years ago. There was, uh, and some of you may remember, there was a state rebate program that was fantastic when it started, and it was the scourge of the industry by the time it ended. And I lived through that period. Uh, I was heading a solar company in Longwood, and I can tell you that that program really drove sales for our company. It got people stimulated, it got the public interested. They believe that if the state is behind it by supporting a rebate, then it must be okay. This must be real, it must be something worth looking into. So it did move a lot of units from that perspective. Um, as you may or may not know, the money did run out. This happens in a lot of markets. Solar is very appealing to the public. It's got a very high consumer approval rating anywhere you go among the public. So any real solar programs that come into place typically get exhausted a lot faster than the, the regulating body may anticipate. So that program, <coughs> I use the term sunsetted uh, in a sort of a negative fashion. It ran out of money. There was a lot of back and forth between the, the state legislature about how to fund this program, whether to fund it, how much to fund. They have too many people applying for these rebates and they settled. I believe at the end they were paying 50 cents on the dollar for the rebates and they closed the program out. Something very interesting from a uh, consumer perspective back then. Our company was selling systems at, I'd say, between $7 and $10 per watt installed back then. And that was kind of the going rate. You know, solar cost a lot more only 10 years ago. It was flying off the shelves because there was a $4 watt rebate which would bring the price down to $3 a lot if you were very lucky and it was a very large system, or um, maybe $6 a lot if it was a normal residential system. So $6 a lot installed, people were very excited. We were just taking orders and running out of paper for this stuff. Fast forward to now, the average installed cost per watt is about $3.25, $3.50 in this area uh, on a residential system. Without a rebate. Pardon? Without a rebate. Without a rebate. So actually, most folks are paying significantly less right now for a solar system than they were 10 years ago with the state rebate program where there's all this fanfare going on and people couldn't order them fast enough. Um, the nature of rebate programs, like I said, is it's an endorsement. It's a third-party endorsement by the government, which is pretty powerful, pretty strong, and that's what really kind of drives developing industries, not just solar, but a lot of different industries. You know, they get the rubber stamp of approval from the government, and the place takes off. So that sort of brings me to the current state of affairs. You know that, uh, and I know this group probably pays more attention than the average consumers do to programs that are out there, but right now you've got, say, Duke Energy. And Duke Energy is an investor-owned utility. And investor-owned utilities are not typically very friendly towards solar. And again, these are my opinions, Richard Smith only. But they're typically not very friendly uh, towards solar energy or any, any renewable energies unless they can own and control them. Then they're very, uh, they view them very favorably. Um, you have munis, we call them, municipal utilities like OUC, uh, GRU, Gainesville Regional Utility. They are much more friendly toward solar energy. They're owned by the ratepayers, the taxpayers basically own these utilities. They typically uh, cooperate much more eagerly and effectively with companies like ours and, and even larger solar development companies than the IOUs do in restaurant utilities. So you may be aware that there's a, there's a program with OUC that is one of the best programs really in the southeastern U.S. It's a production-based incentive, they call it. And what they do is they pay you five cents per kilowatt hour on top of the retail rate for all electricity that you generate that comes from solar. Very fantastic return on investment. Um, it's, the customers are very happy with the solar program. That program is changing, uh, we're told, and this is not on the website, it's not published yet with OUC, but we are told within the industry that the program is going to end at the end of this month and be, and be replaced by a different program. 
which is going to be a direct sales model by OUC, where an OUC will sell the systems to their ratepayers uh, through some <laughs> as yet undetermined mechanism that we're not quite sure of. They put a, uh, an RFP out uh, a little while back, a uh, request for proposal from companies like mine, to bid to be the installation company that could put in all these systems. Uh, we read through the RFP and we opted to not bid. A lot of solar companies opted to not bid on it. Mm -hmm. Similar to some of these community solar initiatives, uh, a lot of companies will opt to not bid on those. And I can go into why, if, if anyone has any questions about that kind of stuff, it's sort of... Business decision. It's a business decision. It's economic. Uh, we're all solar people and we love the sun and we love solar energy, but if you do have a business that has to be profitable in order to stay in business. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my background in solar. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to open it up if anybody has any questions. For me, I don't want to get into a sales pitch for my company or anything like that. I truly just want to answer, you know, kind of consumer-based questions if anyone has any. Well, I guess along those lines, because I'm, I'm developing zero energy apartments, so okay. um, working with Superior, sorry, I've been working with them for a while. Okay. But, um, yeah, so, because I've been looking at that as, you know, obviously potentially better to build within OUC's area. Um, we're still only looking about 4500 a year for free, which is great, um, on the system per building, um, but when I'm looking at a revenue of, you know, 140000 per building doesn't make a huge difference, but he said that's likely to end, and they're switching over to... Uh, we're switching over to the new program now. I will tell you, the other inside baseball on it is that if you submit your application before the cutoff, You'll, they'll grandfather you in. They'll basically mm -hmm. let you go in. And that's whether you move forward or not. You don't have to sign a sales contract or agreement with the company. You just need to submit that mm -hmm. interconnection application, from what I'm told. Mm -hmm. So you may be able to do something there. Yeah, there. Is there a clause in this uh, vote that we have to vote no in that has anything to do with energy storage? Um, not that I'm aware of. And off-grid, uh, you know, if you don't want to be off-grid, is there still the same fee that there always was? There is still a fee to be connected to the grid, even if you're totally not zero, there's still an interconnection. There's a fee, a monthly fee. But if you're not connected, I think there's now a fee. They are, I don't know, is there now a fee, or are they I, trying to? I don't know. Really. I'm not certain about that it's been imposed or not. I keep hearing that they are getting together to yeah. come up with a fee, and it's going to be some, you know, pretty punitive fee. Mm -hmm. Wow, so I want to be in that business, five, charge five, people who don't buy my product? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We lose that vote, and Trump wins. We might as well stop solar in Florida. Well, there are some people that would like to see that happen, that's for sure. Yeah, there's, uh, and you may have seen this covered in the press, and I'm not totally up to speed on it, but I keep hearing that it's, you know, they're trying to make it illegal to go off the grid. You know, somehow it's going to be, you're a criminal if you disconnect from the grid to produce your own power. They have uh, stories that I read about, and this isn't solely related, but, you know, um, rainwater catchment systems. You know, down in South mm -hmm. Florida, there are people that are you know, being fined, from what I understand, for installing those. Mm -hmm. And I guess the argument on the other side is that they are um, inhibiting free flow uh, for water replenishment into the aquifer by, you know, taking 55 gallons of rainwater, you know, on their own property for self-consumption. I don't really understand that argument. That's the argument, from what I understand. They have to have one, otherwise it would just be crazy. They created for Zika. <laughs> Any other questions about solar energy? Could you explain the, um, the tax advantages if this goes through in November? The tax advantages... Um, there really aren't any real tax advantages other than for the folks that are installing the systems. They're, they're basically under the scheme that I laid out before. If this was a commercial building, I come in, I say, Mr. Building Owner, I put a system on here at my expense and I'll sell you the energy. I am now taking the 30% investment tax credit. Is that what you're talking about, the tax credit? Yeah, yeah that would be taken by the, uh, the, the buyer or the aggregator of so systems. They, they the install right. Well, maybe not the installer. It may be a third party, and often it is. It's a third party, kind of like um, a sort of Solar Cities model, where Solar Cities an installation company, but there's a bank very closely connected to them, 
that owns everything. So there's no real tax advantage to the consumer? The only tax advantage would be that um, the consumer would avoid paying sales tax on the energy that they would have consumed from the utility because when you when you're producing solar energy into the system, it's going to drive down your bill from, say, Duke Energy in this case. Well, that bill, you notice, you'd pay sales tax on your on your utility bills, and that sales tax would be reduced. So that's one tax benefit that they would have. There'd be no property tax implications because the system would not be owned by the property owner in that case. Mm -hmm. Now you are you're building apartment complexes, yep. and you're investigating putting solar on. Mm -hmm. We've got one underway right now. They're very interesting trying to incorporate solar into an apartment complex. Yeah, I've been, I've actually been planning it for a couple of years now that everything's set. I already pretty much had it ready to go, but yeah, we're going to be breaking ground pretty soon. You know, so. And are you doing um, just common area electricity needs, or are you doing uh, individual doing, units? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm doing one building for now, um, and actually I'm talking about that right now with them as far as splitting up the meters or using it as one common area. Um, that's mostly regulations more than my choice. So um, depends. I know going into um, <coughs> going into the apartment complex, getting more buildings is going to be a little more involved. I also have a backup system, but it'll also be again, you know, talking about going off the grid. Um, at that scale, it makes a lot more sense to go off the grid than on a single building. So first building is planned to be grid tied. The second one is planned to be grid tied, but also able to go off at any point. And I mean, I could just store yeah. it all anyway. So, <laughs> are you looking into storage at all, like battery storage? Or um, or? that's part of it. Well, same thing at the grid. I've got an even more. I've got a closed loop system. I can actually funnel the electricity back into to get some back out of it and get some at night as well. Good idea. Okay, that's cool, yeah. So, yeah, I don't even necessarily have to use batteries on that one, although I'd likely have a smaller a smaller set of batteries to have the electric, the available electric for night, um, but I'll also have hydro going through. And, yeah, wow, okay, so pretty progressive operation over there. Yeah, it's not as complicated as it sounds, but it's so much to work on. Yeah, there's a lot more storage talk going on, you know, with battery stuff. We just got approved... Uh, about two weeks ago as Tesla's authorized reseller for Florida, or one of two companies in the state of Florida that can resell these Tesla Powerwalls, which have very little economic benefit in Florida, in my opinion, <laughs> but people seem to love them and they want them. They have to have them. So from a business perspective, it's great. Uh, from an economic perspective, we need higher utility rates, I think, to justify putting those things in, or time of use billing, or tiered billing, or something that would justify it. Well, I think the main justification would be hurricanes. If backup up power, system, it's got yeah. a, right, it's got a real yeah. use for backup power, definitely, but it doesn't provide a tremendous amount of backup power. You know, right. It depends on what you're trying to power. Run my refrigerator and electronics in a hurricane and I'm happy. Yeah, if you can, if you can do that, that's usually what we'll do with battery backup systems, is we'll run a, what we call a dedicated circuit. You know, they'll have their vital things on this one circuit that will be backed up by the battery bank. But, um, but speaking of economics, yeah. um, you were saying that most residential installs now are running like 325? The 350. I just use that number because it's in a in a range. I mean, we right. we see them as we see residential two seventy, two dollars seventy cents a watt to you know four dollars a watt depending. On okay, what well, it but is. that's still eligible for the thirty percent federal tax credit, right? Well, the it is if the person filing for it is right. Right, right. assuming they're paying enough taxes that. to take it. Correct. Right, but right. the economics then seem quite compelling. If, if say the installs three bucks a watt, that gets it down to two ten after the tax credit. What kind of rate of return are you looking at there? Five years. Or um, really that's what we see a lot of times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's a twenty percent. If it's we a five year payback, years, though. even if it's a ten year payback, that's a ten percent rate of return, tax free, guaranteed, indexed for inflation. Show me anything in the world that can even come close to that. Yeah. There is a that, company that. Lease kind of leases them to you, or they they claim less than your power bill would be. Right. Well, kind of rent to own. Yeah, because if, less it, than if, your, if your the rate of returns up to ten percent, they could mm -hmm. borrow money at six or seven percent, 
split the difference with you right. and there you go. Yeah, that's that's right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was working, that's how I was originally working with Superior Solar. I was getting remote to uh, basically start that essentially what Solar City, similar to what Solar City does, but actually within OUC's area with that tax credit, you could get people's um, payment down to basically half of what they were paying right. at that level. And that was the main thing with the solar loans because, you know, solar loan, 10 year solar loans will generally put you at about 50% more than you usually spend per month mm -hmm. if you get a 10 year solar loan. If you have a 20 year solar loan, it gets it closer to about three quarters of what you spend. So if you can manage to get a solar loan, they'll let you down. But they're hard to find, and First Green Bank's the only one that I know that'll even do 20 year. There are more coming online. Yeah. Believe it or not, we use a company called Mosaic. Um, Mosaic Solar Loans, they're, uh, uh, I think they're maybe they're out of Oregon. Um, I'd say probably 70% of our loans are through Mosaic. We use First Green Bank quite a bit. We do try to keep everything as local as we can. Um, there are a few other companies that, and there are some that go out for 30 years now. I remember 10 years ago sitting down with a fifth, fifth Third Bank in our conference room and I was trying to explain to the banker how great of an investment solar PV is. This is, again, during the rebate program, everything's going great. Um, and how secure of an investment it is, how, how great the return is, even if it's not, you know, you say 10% tax-free return, look at the tax-adjusted value of a return like that. If you compared it to something where you're, where you're paying capital gains and doing things like that. Yeah, it's untouchable. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not, incredible. There's nothing really. you can and invest your money in. And, and what are the risk points? You know, the sun doesn't come out anymore, or the power company cuts rates in half all of a sudden. Neither thing has ever happened. So, and, and, you know, right, yeah. But I was in fifth, in the meeting with the fifth third bank guy, and I said, look, you'll loan money, you loan $300,000 for a motor coach that plummets in value the second the guy drives it off the lot. It consumes massive amounts of resources, needs a tremendous amount of maintenance and, and money just poured into this thing throughout its useful life. You will loan money for that all day long without blinking an eye, but for a solar system, which is a silent, no moving parts, uh, investment that's on the site, it's a fixed asset, you don't quite understand that. You know, it, it, it works for 30 to 50 years, it doesn't need a lot of maintenance other than cleaning. Um, Possibly more. Pardon? It could last, well, and it will last longer than that, you know, now is it effective, you know, for 100 years, you know, I don't know, it's like there, are so, there are solar panels out there from the 50s that are still producing. NREL's done research on that, panels die from moisture. So um, the panel, there are glass, glass panels where there's a sheet of glass, the solar cells, and then another sheet of glass. Mm -hmm. And if those are sealed with silicone, there's absolutely no moisture infiltration. Those panels might last centuries. Really? The ones that just have a plastic back sheet, they're not going to make it to a 100, 100 year mark. They might make it to the 50 year mark or even the 75, but nobody in 20, 2300 AD will be using them. But glass, glass, silicon sealed, yeah, that, those might last centuries. That's impressive yeah. technology. I mean, we're all biased, obviously, pretty heavily towards solar, you know, so we're talking to ourselves here, but... <laughs> 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 I Have you worked with any uh, possible solar co-ops, or have you thought about... Uh, We've looked that into area? that. We've done, um, not co-ops, but we call them neighborhood programs, where we may come into a subdivision, and over a 90-day period, we'll try to get as many people signed up to get a solar quote as possible and then we'll put discount levels on participation you know say if uh, you know 10 homeowners uh, join the program and agree to move forward then the discount is x percent off of the quote because each quote is individualized you know, each site is unique and, and we treat each customer as a unique site and a unique customer but if they get you know 25 people to participate then there's another discount level that comes into play you know so we've done it and I've been really, we've been doing that, uh, let's say for a good five years, you know, a good five to seven years. And that concept I borrowed from, there's a company called uh, OneBOG.org, One Block Off Grid. They're out, uh, I think they're from Washington, Washington, Oregon area. They're a nonprofit, from what I understand, they're a nonprofit that's a true third party that comes into an area and will sort of like a co op vet various solar companies, various uh, materials, and select a group, um, select a group installer and then a, and a materials provider. They're negotiating with not only the installer, but the 
material suppliers on top of that to, to leverage them for better pricing, bundling it, and then doing a, a group program. So it's a, probably the best way to do it kind of thing, you know, because they're truly a third party. They're not profit. They're, uh, they're not profit. They have no financial interest in the whole game. Um, so I sort of borrowed the concept and applied it to our for-profit business and said, well, how can we drive this down? How can we drive these costs down? Because we legitimately can. If you get a neighborhood to sign up and there's 50 homeowners in there, that's a large commercial project, basically, is what that equates to. Uh, okay, now, 25, let's say you could get a group of 25 families, how much uh, discount do you think that would be able to provide them? Uh, we usually, we'll usually go up to 20%, okay. up to a 20% discount from our best price because there are economies of scale for us, too. For example, it's not just the material suppliers, the panels, the rack, the inverter manufacturers. There, there is some savings you, you can realize there, but if you study the cost of solar systems, you'll notice installation is a huge chunk of the cost. Mm -hmm. That's really where we can drive it down. We're, you know, we'll have our crews come into this neighborhood, and they'll do a phased build instead of a, a, you know, a total build. They'll come in and they'll mount rails all in a two-week period, they're just mounting rail in this neighborhood. They come in, they're mounting inverters, they're mounting panels, they're connecting optimizers to modules, things like that. So that's where the bulk of our discount really comes from. And it's, we, in most cases, can preserve our margin when we do these programs. So to me, I don't care, I like it, because it's, it's delivering value and savings to people, it's real, and we make the same money that we need to make because our, our operation is much more efficient can do it that way. So that's you know, kind of a win-win. And I would imagine we've not participated in uh, any of the co-op deals for various reasons, but I would imagine that uh, whoever is, is uh, participating in those is you know, having a similar experience, hopefully. That's, that's the way that they're kind of strategizing on you know, being able to meet that. Because the co-ops, the price has really driven down quite a bit. I mean, it really is quite a bit. And in our experience, it's difficult to deliver a, a level of installation quality and, and integrity that you would want to stand behind, you know, you'd want to answer your phone in 10 years and still meet that price goal with mm -hmm. some of these co-ops. I think they're, they're sort of overly aggressive. So what kind of time frame, let's say you have a group of people are thinking of going to some sort of co-op, you know, your company, um, from the beginning to the actual installation, how much time do you with our programs, it's, we do 90 days. So we'll do a 90-day program and we'll close it out because it, otherwise it drags on forever. Yeah. You have some changes. people want to do it now and some people want to wait and it's sort of you have to have a hard close out in my experience to, to kind of push people that way. But I mean, the normal installation is, you know, right now, depending on the municipality and how difficult it is to get a permit, um, Four to six weeks, somewhere in that range, is what it generally takes. Sometimes it's get a three weeks. No, no, no. To have your system up and installed oh, okay. and commissioned and running. How long does it take to get a permit now? Uh, it could be anywhere from a day to oh, okay. three weeks. Are you trying to sell as much as you can right now coming up to the boat? Um, <laughs> we're not trying to necessarily. We're, uh, we're at capacity. I think most solar companies right now are very busy. Um, so we're not really doing anything differently because of the boat. We are, I, I don't think really anybody's doing anything differently other than large national solar chains like Solar City and Vivint and some of these folks are definitely watching Florida because if this thing is, um, if it's defeated, they're going to come in a little, a lot stronger. Right now Solar City's operating in, in Central Florida, Vivint is operating in Tampa. Those are two strong companies. I mean, that's the number one and number two residential solar contracting companies in, in the country. So they, uh, this is a test market for them, for sure. And they go into markets and they pull out of markets. And it depends on, you know, they are really driven by market conditions that uh, are affected by legislation. I mean, their business models are they're, they're massive companies. And a little competition won't hurt you? No, 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 no. Yeah. Good, good, good competition. That's what's sort of exciting to me about these bigger companies coming in is that ideally, I mean, competition, what does it do? It forces you to become better or find a niche to hide in, you know, or, or something like that. But it generally will force you to up your game quite a bit. In the case, uh, in my personal view, uh, I look at a company like Solar City, 
that I, I have a lot of respect for. They've scaled their operation pretty quickly. I mean, they're a company that was started in 2009, which is not very long ago, and they are the number one solar company in the country. So they've got a lot of things that uh, little companies like us can learn from, but they do have challenges on the consumer uh, side. If you go and you look at reviews online, for example, which our company, I mean, we live and die by reviews. We are dead serious about online reviews. I believe personally in the power of online reviews. So their company, uh, I think, scaled too quickly. And when that happens, you, you lose something in the quality uh, and, and when you're touching customers out there. So that's evident online. If you go and you do some research on Solar City and Vivint, Vivint has a slightly higher rating than Solar City does. We try to maintain um, a five star or whatever the equivalent is on every site. As far as I'm aware, we do have that. Uh, actually, I think we have a 4.8 on solarreviews.com, which is a fantastic uh, site for consumer reviews on solar. How durable are these panels nowadays? They are, um, what I'll usually tell people is they're as durable as a car windshield in that uh, they're able to withstand similar impacts as tempered glass, after all, tempered glass versus tempered glass. They are, uh, you know, the biggest thing that could damage a solar panel is going to be a tree limb, a tree branch, uh, something flying through the air in, in a storm. They're usually mounted at an angle. Uh, hail really doesn't uh, have too much of an impact on solar panels because of the angle. The hail's coming down, it sort of deflects that way. It's not parallel or perpendicular to the hail. So um, very rarely do we have any issues with a solar panel that's broken. Or, uh, you are do... solar panels covered by uh, homeowners insurance? They are. If you, um, yeah, if you inform them that you have a solar system installed. And they are. If it's, uh, if it's a manufacturing defect, for example, like, uh, just, like you were talking about the uh, delamination, they call that, that happens where the water can penetrate in there. Those are covered typically by a manufacturer's warranty, and that's a 25 year term. The uh, manufacturers will have what's called a production warranty. It's very interesting with PV panels. They have, uh, you know, there's a structural warranty that says that, look, if this thing disintegrates or something happens to it, we're going to cover it. And those are usually between five and 10 years. For the structural warranty, when they have a power production warranty that's 25 to 30 years generally, most of them are 25. Some of the newer companies will have a, a slightly longer warranty to get some market traction. An hour and a half to pick it. Those are power production <laughs> warranties. Well, the nature uh, of a PV panel is that if you do have an issue in which there's water intrusion, hazing, yellowing, anything with the glass, that's going to affect the power production. And so the power production warranty is almost serves as a suit to not warranty for the panel for 25 years if you can tie it to power production, which almost anything that happens to that panel is going to affect the power production. Um, yeah. You mentioned that you, um, you uh, welcome competition because it helps make you better. But, uh, would you be willing to coach and advise a, a new company uh, looking to install in the area? Uh, would I be willing to coach and advise? I mean, we do consulting work for well, companies a lot. A, like a solar co-op, if you start your solar co-op, then via your business. Or well, if you were, if it was a solar co-op, you're talking about a for-profit solar company. Mm -hmm. We do we do consulting work. Okay. We do that, and we've helped many companies. We've performed complete installations for competitors before because it was sort of outside their wheelhouse. Yeah, they they sold it. They weren't sure what to do, and they call us. We come out and help them. We cannot do all the solar. I mean, a hundred companies in Orlando can't do all the solar. In Orlando, so there's well, no threat there. We, we um, I, I'm a friend of mine. I, I'm working with him. I actually manage. He, he has an electric bike shop up in Longwood. I manage his store. He's a doctor, and he also he sells, he sells uh, solar panels in Haiti right now and installs them. And we're thinking of starting here in Florida, especially if all this comes about. And uh, uh, his major concern is uh, installation, installers. Which is major concern. Yeah. Because he's got access to the panels and batteries and whatever we need for that. Yeah, it's a specialized trade and it's difficult to find yeah. the guys that are trained, you know, especially in Florida. Our market's different from a lot of the country in that we've got a lot of solar thermal here as well. We've got pool heating, water heating, solar attic fans, and PV. If you go to uh, you go out west, they really don't deal in solar water heating very much. You know, it's not that big of a product there. So our technicians, for example, I mean, we've got uh, we've got three full-time crews um, or three full-time crew leaders 
And all three of those guys have, I would say, a minimum 10 years experience in the field in Florida working before they can meet a crew. And then we've got, you know, a helper, minimum one helper with each crew, and those even those guys have, you know, usually a few years experience. We tend to look for people with a background in, uh, as an electrician, electrician apprentice, roofers are really good in background. And plumbers are, are pretty good backgrounds. Electrician and plumbers are great backgrounds, mm -hmm. as long as they're not afraid of heights. That's like the only thing mm -hmm. that these guys <laughs> can't be well, afraid of heights. Well, we really appreciate uh, Richard's yeah. um, you know, spending the time with us.